Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as, as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is a great one on the Book of Revelation. This particular lesson is lesson number eight in that series for February 23 of 2019, entitled Satan, A Defeated Enemy. Boy, I wish he seemed more defeated sometimes. It seems like he's pretty active still to me. But this is what we're going to talk about, Satan, a defeated enemy. And as usual, we're going to ask you to join us in prayer as we start. Our kind and loving Father, as we take up these lessons and consider all they should mean to us, help us to get, get even a small portion of all that's here to our edification is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. A number of scholars have recognized that the book of Revelation is organized in a kind of V pattern. In the ancient Greek language, it was called a chiasm. And so that the most important part of that chiasm is the part right in the middle. And it's w that way with the book of Revelation as well. The most important part is the, right in the middle, and that's the part we're coming to right now. Revelation 12, 13, and 14. Um, anyone know what the exact middle of the book of Revelation is? In the Greek? In the Greek. You mean picking out the, the word that's right in the middle? No. I don't know the exact word, but it's, it's the description of Satan in Revelation 12. Mm -hmm. About verse 10, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Down there. Is right, that's, that is the epicenter, if you will, of, of the book of Revelation. So, in Revelation 12, written after all the disciples and apostles except John were dead, it gives us the background story of the great controversy. Seventh-day Adventists need to understand Revelation 12 to 14 forwards and backwards. I wish we could all memorize it. These three chapters shed light on what we've already studied in the first half of Revelation, but especially they are important in preparing us for the second half of the book of Revelation starting with chapter 15 through 22. In the first half of the book we have looked at the struggles that the Christian church has faced until modern times and in the last half of the book we will look at the final events in this world's history. So here in the middle, by the way, yes. do you think that John prepared this, the description of Satan to be right in the middle? I, do you think he wrote and rewrote and planned out the words or? Well, what I know is that there are a number of passages, a number of places in the Bible, Old Testament, a number of them in the Old Testament, and some in the New Testament that are organized like this. And now whether God arranged that as he inspired his prophets or whether he gave them the material and, and they sort of, how, sort of organized it like that? Well, um, some, some books like say the Gospels or the letters you know, the person is sort of pulling things from many different directions and organizing and things. But this, John is told to write the things that he hears and sees. So I would ascribe the chiastic structure to, to God because he's the one that put this all together. Now, John has to write it down, of course, but he's, he's more dependent on what he sees and hears than on you know, well, how should I do this? Okay, here's a challenge for you scriptural buffs. What book of the Bible, the entire book, is organized like a chiasm? Apart from this one here in Revelation, which is sort of chiastic. There's another one. I'll give you a clue. It's in the Old Testament. The book of Song of Solomon is a chiasm clearly, very clearly a chiastic book. And there are a number of psalms. I think it's Psalm 9 and 10, I believe, is a chiasm, and I should have looked at these up. But there are a number of these, mm -hmm. uh, these chiastic things in the Bible. And again, they're chiastic in the original language, not necessarily in English. Well, no, they're, they're, I'm, we're not talking about counting actual words, which happens to work out in this case. We're talking about ideas. The beginning matches, the idea here matches what's there, and the idea here matches what's there, and the idea here matches what's there, and they get down to the very center, and that's the, 
the most focus. Important, yeah. The most important. When we part. write a book, we have we the most important thing at the end. Exactly. Yeah. So. But with John, when you think about this man who is writing this book under those circumstances, he's writing about things he doesn't even understand. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Which means that God did have an, an amazing amount of inspiration injected into <laughs> John for yeah, such exactly. a book. Yeah, and you can't, I've been trying to, I had the privilege of visiting the Isle of Patmos um, a couple years ago. And um, I think about that, of course, when I, when I look at the book of, of Revelation. And we don't know exactly where he was. It was a, it's a little tiny island, it's not a big island. And we don't know exactly, was he, was he given like chapter one as a vision and he wrote that down and then chapter two and three together and he wrote that down and, or was he given a whole bunch of stuff all together and they tried to organize that? We just don't know. We just yeah. do not. The fact that it brings out that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day yeah. implies that it may have been over the, that one day. Well, for sure that first chapter is, but do we know that the rest of the book is on that day? Well, it seems to I'll look up Maybe. here, follow me here, mm -hmm. and then I saw, and so forth and so on. Well, if Satan and his evil angels know that we're coming up to their final demise, what do you suppose they're going to do? They're going to get real mad, and they're going to try to mess things up as as much as they can. This well, is an all-out battle. Yes. The last thing they want is for God's plan of salvation to work. Yeah. Therefore, they have to fight it tooth and nail. And, and what they would like most of all, considering the fact that they know that it's coming to an end, the more you can delay it, mm -hmm. the longer you can live, right? Well, look at Revelation 12, 1 to 5. Then a great and mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a woman we need to know who, who these women represent, whose dress was the sun and who had the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was soon to give birth and the pain and suffering of childbirth made her cry out. Another mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and a crown on each of his heads. With his tail, he dragged a third of the stars out of the sky and threw them down to the earth. He stood in front of the woman in order to eat her child as soon as it was born. Then she gave birth to a son who will rule over all nations with an iron rod, but the child was snatched away and taken to God and his throne. So what does all that mean? Well, let's look at the symbols one by one. <coughs> Women are used in the Bible as what? Representatives of what? Church. God's people. Lord. God's professed people. Some of them are faithful and some of them are not so faithful, right? We know about harlots and prostitutes, and we know about the faithful women that are dressed in white and so forth. So a pure and chaste woman stands for the faithful believers, and the harlots, of course, represent apostate Christians. Look at 2 Corinthians 11.2 and Revelation 12.13-17. Um, this woman we're reading about here in Revelation 12 at the beginning is first pictured as God's faithful people from the days of Adam down to the time of Christ, and then as giving birth to Jesus himself. So that would be referring to the ancient peoples up to the time of Abraham and his descendants and then the Jewish people. And finally, they gave birth to, to, to Christ, didn't they? To, to Jesus, anyway. And then what happened, Fred? Well, this is a statement from the adult Sabbath school lesson. Uh, this woman is portrayed as clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet. The sun represents the glory of Christ's character his righteousness, Malachi 4, verse 2. He is the light of the world, John 8, 12. And his people are to reflect the light of God's loving character to the world in Matthew 5, 14 to 16. The moon, as the lesser light, Genesis 1, 16, points to the Old Testament promises foreshadowing the work of Christ in the gospel era. The next thing John sees in a vision is a fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, Revelation 12, 3. This dragon is later identified as Satan in 12, 9. His tail symbolizes the means used 
to deceive, Isaiah 9.14, Revelation 9.10. Drag the third of the stars from heaven down to the earth, Revelation 12.4. This action shows that having fallen from the, his exalted position in heaven, Isaiah 14.12-15, Satan was able to deceive a third of the angels. These fallen angels are the demons who assist the devil in opposing God and his work of salvation, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Revelation also uses the dragon described as having seven heads and ten horns as a symbol of those agents in the world used by Satan, pagan Rome, Revelation 12, 4, and spiritualism, Revelation 16, 13. And once again, with all these references here that you are out there, you're listening to this, you might want to look up some of these references. The simplest way to get all of them is go to our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And uh, you can download our handout and all the, all the references will be right there for you. Well, down through the century, Satan has had various organizations and groups working on his behalf here on this earth. And Ellen White has some words about that. Uh, Dennis? Yes, this is from Great Contro Controversy uh, 438, uh, paragraph 2. The dragon is said to be Satan, Revelation 12, 9. He it was that moved upon Herod to put the Savior to death. But the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is, in a secondary sense, a symbol of pagan Rome. Okay, so here's an example of something we talked about last week, where a beast, in this case it's a dragon, is re represents what? It represents a religious power, a religious group, pagan Rome, being supported by what? The, whole, the, Ro the Roman Empire, the military and civil authorities of the Roman em Empire. So in the Bible, those, that combination of civil and religious authority, military authority, is called a beast. Well, we've already suggested that the number one-third, as used in Revelation, primarily represents the activity of Satan and his followers. And there it is again in Revelation 12, 4. He, he did what with the angels in heaven? Up to a third of the stars. Up down a third of the stars. With, with his tail. With his tail. Not his head. No, <laughs> his tail. Exactly. Um, he even deceived one third of the angels in heaven who were standing around the throne of God. How successful do you have to be as a deceiver to, de to, to, to deceive people standing around the throne of God? I mean, it just boggles my mind every time I think about it. Yeah, it's not just people, it's yeah. in very intelligent angels. Yes. So, he, he, he's, he comes down to this earth. He's there, we know, from Genesis 1 and 2. He's there from the beginning of our Earth's history, or, or at least our world's history, and he's called the ancient serpent right there in Revelation. So, what do you think? John is referring to when he calls him the ancient serpent. Eden. Right there, the snake, the serpent that was in the tree that deceived Eve, right? Eve and then Adam ate of the fruit of that tree and thus surrendered their dominion over this earth to Satan. So what did God, uh, well, God and his angels told Adam and Eve that a Messiah was coming, Genesis 3.15. And it's not so obvious in English, but it was very clear in Hebrew it says that the one who's going to bruise the, the, the devil's tail, or I'm sorry, feet, is, head, let me get it right, is one who's going to bruise the devil's head is singular. And who is that, of course? Christ. Christ. The child was cut up to God and his throne. Well, there's very important, there, there are so many references. Uh, uh, yes. You know, to come back to the text about bruising his head, it's his head, his way of thinking. It's his mindset that is cut down. Yep, exactly. Now We're going to. How does God do that? Yeah. Does well, he reveal truth. 
Mm -hmm. Is that what weapon does God really have? If He's the Creator, what is the it weapon does He have to deal with errors, uh, false concepts, false teachings? Well, let, what does he, God use? Let's be clear. He could, if He chose to use His power, He could wipe out all His enemies. <coughs> he has that ability. He has that ability, but that's not what He does. No. He uses well, truth to destroy evil. He's the Creator. Yeah. Is he a creator and a killer part-time? Well, I mean, obviously he doesn't, but he could. Let, well, we, let's, we, let's we, not it, limit it's his assumption. power. It's an assumption that we, a presupposition that we have, a paradigm that we've been raised with. We say, man, we attribute uh, wars, we attribute um, uh, floods and uh, hurricanes and all that. We call those in insurance policies acts of God. Yeah. But are they really acts of God? No. So, I mean, if God is love, is he, oh, and, and then we probably improperly defined what love is. Mm -hmm. Well, let's read an example of that. War broke out in heaven. And what were the weapons? Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels, but the dragon was defeated. And he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out that ancient serpent, there's that expression, called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world, he was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Now, what do we know about the timing of that? Anybody? Before the creation of this earth. Before the creation of this earth, well, this world anyway. Uh, if you want to make that careful distinction between the earth being the, the rock and the, and the water and the whatever, whereas the world is the created living uh, biosphere on top of that. Uh, technically, that's the difference in, in the original languages. Um, and what was his goal almost from the very beginning? Satan said, that one person is going to come, and he thinks he's going to crush my head. I am going to get him, right? And what happened? Verse 5, Revelation 12. He's, he failed. Christ was finally taken back up to heaven in perfect harmony with his Father, no failure whatsoever. Well, he failed multiple times along the way because he failed at the flood, he failed later on, uh, he failed throughout history, and then comes Christ, and that's where he really gets it. Yeah. Okay, now here's the big question, the biggest question of the whole night. Why is it? that God waited to talk about the great controversy and how it began in heaven until the very end of John's life, after all the other apostles are dead, way after everything that happened in the Old Testament. And he's, I mean, you know, he, at the time he wrote this down, he wasn't sure anybody would ever hear about it. He wasn't sure there'd be any way to get it off the island of Patmos. The question was, why, why did uh, he wait so long? Why does wait God so, wait so God? long? Yeah, well, we've, we've got the uh, book of Job, chapter 1 and 2. We've got, uh, well, the whole book of Job, but the, the last part in particular. Uh, you've got First uh, Kings 22, 22 and following. You've got, you've got Zechariah in, in, in yes. several places. Yeah. And all those pieces fit, but you, you couldn't know that until you get the picture from Revelation 12. Oh, guess what? All these pieces fit. Well, so, yeah, I think we have to remember that the Bible... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just... I, the, the Bible begins with Abraham, so, so to speak, okay? And it was not even written until Moses comes along. Exactly. We don't know what they knew before that. Yeah. We don't know what the antediluvians knew. They probably knew about this war in heaven far better than we even do today. Possible. The point is that... Uh, there was no way for those people at that time in Abraham's day or in Moses' day to even begin to understand a war in heaven. Mm -hmm. Especially that the word war implies that there was a physical battle, and that's not the way God fights. Mm -hmm. So it's reserved for us at the end of time to begin to understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And probably John may himself not have known what this war was all about. Do you think uh, Paul understood the great controversy? 
He had some good insights into he it. He certainly did. Six twelve yeah. and the first. And well, he was caught up to third heaven. He says yeah. and uh, was shown things that he wasn't able to reveal to others, at least not at that time. But the kingdom of grace was established uh, when Christ died on the cross and when he ascended and anointed uh, anointed heaven basically. Uh, so this this would be and, and the seals then are opened. So until the seals are opened, we there are many things we wouldn't know. Yeah. So why are we given so much more information than Moses and Job and that was these people question. that talked to God? Yeah. Well, well, we have a lot more information in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Let me just read a couple of the Isaiah 14 verses. King of Babylonia. Bright morning star, the other word, the translation of bright morning star in Latin is what? Lucifer. Lucifer. You have fallen from heaven. In the past you conquered nations, but now you have been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb up to heaven and place your throne above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north with the gods assemble. You said that you, were, you, you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the Almighty. But instead you have been brought down to the deepest part of the world of the dead, which we now is the, called the abyss. And Ezekiel 28, I'm not going to take time to read that now because our clock is moving along. The incredible arrogance and self-deceit that led Lucifer, now Satan, in his rebellion against God is hard to believe. In his assumed role as a leader of this earth, he even returned to heaven and accused Job, Job 6 through 1, chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, and compare John 12, 31, and what did, he, what did he say to Jesus? Luke 4, 6. He said, I will give you all this power and all this wealth, the devil told him. It has all been handed over to me, and I can give it to anyone I choose. Luke 4, yeah. 6. <laughs> Do you think Jesus was tempted to say, uh, by the way, who gave it to you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, just incredible that the devil would claim that he had the right to give this earth that he knew perfectly well was created by God, and here's God in a human form there standing in front of him. He says, well, let me give you back. He didn't say back, but let me give you what belongs to me. Not really. Well, try to imagine Lucifer making this kind of a claim to Jesus in the wilderness of temptation. So by his life and his death, Jesus redeemed what had been lost and the truth about Satan's character was demonstrated before the universe. And that's an important thing to, to recognize. We often say Jesus demonstrated the truth about God. No, that's truth. He, he, that's very true. He, he lived a life and he died the death that God planned so that we could learn all things. But he also demonstrated the truth about Satan. And the truth about Satan is that he's a liar. I, 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 Someday, we will have that opportunity to watch in that panorama, watch Jesus himself standing in front of the Sanhedrin and saying, you are of your father the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. Imagine. I mean, these were his, supposed, these were the people who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the children of Israel at that time. Hmm. Well, Jesus proved that sin leads to death and that Satan is a liar and a deceiver. And Ellen White has some comments about that. Jim? Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before, before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Henceforth, his work was restricted. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 761. So in what way was it restricted? No one would talk no to him was, anymore. Yeah, Nobody out there that. in the universe would pay any attention to him anymore. Well, but the, the, the great conflict is not over yet. The universe knows that the rule of the, over this earth has been transferred back to Satan, from Satan to Jesus. He has proclaimed the legitimate ruler over the earth, Ephesians 1, 20 through 22, and Philippians 2, 9 and 10. We should read that, Philippians 2, 9 and 10, just to notice something very important here. For this reason, 
and it's talking about the coming of Jesus and his life and death, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings, how many is all? Everyone, right? In heaven, on earth, and in the world below, which is refers to the world of the dead, will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And who does that include? Satan. Satan. Satan himself. All beings. Satan himself will be down on his knees saying, God, I don't like this, but you did everything you could possibly do to save as many as possible. So as we read um, in Revelation 12, Satan knows all of this and he's furious. He knows that he has only a short time left. He is determined to cause as much pain, suffering, and havoc as possible, and he does everything he possibly can to deceive and destroy as many as possible. Matthew 24, 24. There's a, there's a common expression in English that describes that. Misery loves company. Misery loves company. So we as professed Christians trying to follow the truth need to recognize that we are not just fighting against human evils and problems, but also we are fighting against spiritual powers, against the forces of Satan on every side. And that, of course, is Ephesians 6. Well, look at verses 13 and 14 of Revelation 12. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he began to pursue the woman who had given birth to the boy. She was given the two wings of a large eagle in order to fly to her place in the desert where she will be taken care of for three and a half years, safe from the dragon's attack. And um, we Adventists think we figured out what that refers to. What does it refer to? 1260 years. Okay, and what happens during those 1260 years with God's faithful church? They flee to hidden places, uh, flee the persecution that... Uh, the Walden Seas were part of that group. They were hiding away in the mountains of Vaudois on the French side. And then in the latter part of that 1260 years, they fled persecution in Europe and came to America where freedom of religion was number one. Unless you disobeyed with the religion of the, of the uh, particular city or colony. Yeah. And then eventually they actually had religious liberty. And I'm quoting now from Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, pages 194 and 195. The casting down of Satan as an accuser of the brethren in heaven was a accomplished by the great work of Christ in giving up his life. Notwithstanding Satan's persistent opposition, the plan of redemption was being carried out. Satan, knowing that the empire he had usurped would in the end be wrested from him, determined to spare no pains to destroy as many as possible the creatures whom God had created in his image. He hated man because Christ had manifest for him such forgiving love and pity and he now prepared to practice upon him every species of deception by which he might be lost. He pursued his course with more energy because of his own, own hopeless condition. And that's also found in STA Bible Commentary, 973 paragraph 10. Well, think about some times when Satan thought he had almost won in the great controversy. Can you mention any times? At the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Yeah. Some later times, didn't he think he had just about won before the flood? Flood. Yeah. yeah. Do you think he, he he thought he had just about won when when at the at the Tower of Babel? Mm -hmm. Did he think he just about won just before Moses? I mean, before Abraham was chosen. He he obviously thought he just about won just before Jesus showed up. He thought he had just about won when Jesus was dead. And the disciples, the few disciples are hiding in, in a room for fear of their enemies. Can you think of any other times when he, he thinks he might have won? Well, he got, made sure all the apostles were killed brutally, most of them. Mm -hmm. Middle of the Dark Ages, that yep. period. Well, each time 
just when it seemed like Satan is about to win, God does something. And what happened after the death of Christ? Resurrection. Resurrection and the, the big spread of the thing was Pentecost, wasn't it? 3,000 people baptized in one day. Well, we now know that that period extended from what we've already talked about it from 538 to 1798 when Napoleon's general Berthier arrested the Pope and put him in prison where he died shortly thereafter. And that, that prophecy, that 1260 day, 42 month, three and a half year period is mentioned several times in the book of Daniel, several times in the book of Revelation. So it must be really important. We know that Satan succeeded in bringing many corruptions into the so-called church, Christian church. Then he was able to use his power, to use his corrupt church to turn around and persecute those who remained faithful. That's, I mean, just imagine, both of these groups claim to be Christians. Just think about that. Well, we read in Revelation 17, verse 15, the angel also saw, said to me, the waters you saw on which the prostitute is sitting are nations, peoples, races, and languages. So we're going to read about water repeatedly for, in the rest of the book of, of Revelation. So each time we read about water, we're supposed to think of what? People. Groups of people. Look at Revelation 12, verse 16, for example. But the earth, the earth helped the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the water that had come from the dragon's mouth. What would be the water that comes from the dragon's mouth? The armies. Huge armies that were sent out. There's a story told about the time, one time when a huge Roman army was sent up into the um, mountains there to try to wipe out the Walden Seas. And they, they had them trapped at the top of a little mountain. There was no way for them to get away. They were completely surrounded by the Roman army. And in the middle of the night, the whole hundreds of Walden Seas came down that mountain, walked right through the Roman camp, including small children, walked out the other side and up the other side. And when the Roman army woke up the next morning, they saw them disappearing over the mountain in the other direction. You know, God does marvelous things for his, for his people when they're faithful to him. Well, then came the Protestant Reformation. About 100 years later, the doors opened for people to escape to America and practice their religious freedom away from the persecutions of the apostate church. And then I think, Fred, you have yeah, something more? A statement here. I think how long the persecutions here lasted. 1,260 years of persecution. Wow. That's incredible. What should this great duration tell us about how limited we are in understanding why things, such as the return of Christ, seems to be taking so long, at least from our perspective? Yeah. Now it's been how long? 173 years already, right? 174 years already. Past October 22, 174 years, and we're still here. But how does that compare to 1260 years? <laughs> Pretty small piece, right? But so, think about what's happened since then, the changes that took place in the world, yep. compared to all the changes that took place in the world before 1844. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the rate of change is just phenomenal. Revelation 12, 17. Here's a verse that is precious to Seventh-day Adventists. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments, and the King James says, have the faith of Jesus. My version says, are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. There's, and, the, and the Greek can go either way um, in that passage. And, and I think both are absolutely true. So who are these rest or these remnant of that faithful woman? The way I put it when I translate from the Greek, yeah. here are they who keep the commandments of God because they have the faith of Jesus or the mindset of Jesus. Exactly. That's very good. So what does it mean to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus? 
So how large is this? Is, is, that a, is there a better way to keep the commandments? It is listen to his instruction? Because you yeah. read through the Bible, he says you don't listen. You don't, uh, yeah. you don't take instruction. And uh, keeping commandments, commandment is a, a prescription, is a better way of saying it. So you don't want to listen. So well, Jesus, Jesus came to do the will of the Father, which is also a way of saying the commandments of God. And the faith that he has, had was to walk in that path and do only what God directed him to do and, and say. What is a remnant? What's Something left? that's left over. I can no remember peace. my mother when I was a little child, of course obviously many years ago, she would, she would go to these cloth places and they would, there would be a big sign, remnant sale. And you would go through there and I remember she'd say, is that enough for me to make a dress out of a skirt or enough of this or, or maybe I can make something for you, is this enough? And there were odd pieces because people had bought everything except those remnants. So I, remnant is really meaningful to me. So what are the imp two important characteristics? We've already talked about them, the two important characteristics. The first four commandments of God focus on worshiping the true God. Contrary to what many think today, many think that when we come to the end, it's going to be a choice of, okay, will we serve God or will we not serve God? That's not the truth. When we come to the end, the final issue in the great controversy will be over worship, sure enough. It will not be a question of whether we worship or do not worship. It will be over who we worship. One group will worship God and the other group will worship the devil. Everyone will be loyal to one or the other. Now, if you go out in the streets of any major city in America today and said, try to tell people that someday they're going to worship the devil, they will mo they'll mock you. They'll say, what kind of foolishness is that? So what do we mean when we say people will worship the devil? They will think as he does, which is uh, do thy own will instead of doing the will of God. Yep. I will... I will this is, this is who I am, this is how I do things, and don't dare interfere with what I want to do. We don't have any selfish people in the world today, do we? Full of everybody's <laughs> born that way. <laughs> You're talking about the people out there, not yeah, us, right? Not us, not us, of course, no. <laughs> yeah. So the devil has been doing pretty good at spreading his personality around, hasn't he? Well, when we talk about the faith of Jesus, we're reminded, we're reminded to look over to Revelation 19.10, and it says here, I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do it, because this is an angel. I am a servant together with you and with your fellow believers. All those who hold to the truth that Jesus revealed worship God. For the truth that Jesus revealed, or in other words, the faith of Jesus, is what inspires the prophets, or is the spirit of prophecy. So, how do we use that as Seventh-day Adventists? Incorrectly. Well, hmm? <laughs> incorrectly? Well, no, not incorrectly, but let's say in a pretty narrow way. We, we're, it's not nearly as, as broad and wide. Almost certainly, these verses say, what they're really saying is that at the end of the world, there will be a group of people, a whole group of people, who are inspired by the truth of God and go out and, and are ready to give their lives to spread that gospel to the whole world. Um, now, traditionally, we have said this refers to Ellen White and her writings, which I absolutely believe are inspired, but those writings need to grab us. They need to be in, in here to the point, and along with the writings of the Bible, and so that we are out, and like Paul said, we're, we have a fire burning at us. We can't keep quiet about the truth about God. The prophecy of Joel that Peter claimed at the time of the Pentecost, uh, the early rain will be repeated at the latter rain, that the, your sons and daughters will prophesy and your old man will dream dreams and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. So It was prophesied way back in the days of Joel. Yeah. Well, let's be honest. We as a Seventh-day Adventist church have access to more truth than any other group that has ever lived in the history of our world. 
I mean, there's just no question about that. We have the Bible. We have all the writings of Ellen White. We are just, I mean, we're flooded with the truth. What are we doing with it? Are we taking advantage of that? Well, Revelation 12 reveals a panorama of Satan's methods used to try to win in the great controversy. Satan has used lies and deceit. He has used force when God will allow it. He has corrupted the church by subtle compromises. We already mentioned that during the Dark Ages, it was Christians against so-called Christians against real Christians. Remember? Satan has tried to kill those who try to reform the church. But as the end of time approaches, I mean, look what he did to the, the uh, ten of well, eleven disciples. This oh, he's going to wait, wait. Satan is going to wage this all-out war against God's faithful people. This war will include a large element of deception, but evil angels working miracles and producing spiritualistic manifestations will be introduced. Okay, tell me how Satan's going to work miracles. What kind of miracles can Satan work? We certainly produced a lot of miracles uh, before Moses and Pharaoh. Pretty amazing to produce serpents out of pieces of wood. He can yep. do healings. He can do healings. He, he causes the disease and he can do the healing of that disease. Mm -hmm. There's Ill stories of that. In illusions. Uh, also illusions. E right. every, every, magician, every possible yeah deceitful technique you can imagine. I mean, look at what's happening in the movies today. People are given huge awards and millions of dollars because they've invented ways through use of computers and so forth to make, th make it look like people fly and they make it look like all kinds, of, they make it look like animals talk, they make it, I mean, think of all the animation kinds of things that, they're, that are happening in movies. Lying wonders. If, if, lying wonders. If people can do that, and some of them I think are inspired by the devil, what will the devil be able to do? I mean, but amazing. Even without directly being involved, look at the division in politics, for example. Yeah. I mean, it's tearing us apart. Yeah. Uh, can't say it's directly the devil, but certainly the devil, the mindset of the devil, and that's the mindset that is to be crushed at the end of time thanks to the message of Jesus and the mindset of Jesus, the faith of Jesus that will crush that mindset that divides people. Well, we know from the book of Revelation, well, I mean, it, no, I, I, not just in Revelation, 2 second, second Thessalonians 2, 8 to 12, Revelation 13, 13 and 14, Revelation 19, 20, and then starting in Revelation right through to the end, Revelation 12, 9, 13, 14, 18, 23, 19, 20, 20, 20, verse 8. Many, many places it talks about Satan's efforts to deceive, his ability to deceive, if it were possible, the very elect. So, Dennis, I think you have some words about that. Yeah, this is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday, February 21. Uh, it says bold type is added. Is that mm -hmm. something you put in there? No, that mean the the, the bold only, only the bolding is added. We d I just made bold what was ordinary there. What was there? Okay. He uses in turn political and religious powers to do his work. Pagan Rome, symbolized by the dragon, Revelation twelve four and five, followed by a power symbolized by the sea beast, Revelation twelve six and fifteen, Revelation thirteen one to eight. And finally, a power symbolized by the earth beast, Revelation 13, 11. Through the rest of the book, the members of this satanic triad, paganism, spiritualism, as symbolized by the dragon, Roman Catholicism, symbolized by the sea beast, and apostate Protestant, Protestantism, symbolized by the lamb-like or earth-like beast, are inseparably united in opposing God's activities in the world. They work together to deceive people in order to turn them away from God and to get them to side with Satan in the battle of that great day of God Almighty, Revelation 16, 13, and 14. These false religious systems will be destroyed together at the second coming, Revelation 19, 20, while the dragon symbolizing the devil who worked through these earthly powers, Revelation 12, 9, will be destroyed at the end of time, uh, end of the thousand years, Revelation 20, 10. 
Revelation shows that the end time deception will be so great that most people will be led to choose the way of destruction, Matthew 7, 13. Let me just read that verse because it's in this context it has a really impact. Matthew 7, 13, go into the narrow gate because the gate to hell is wide and the road that leads to it is easy and there are many who travel it. That's certainly going to be true at the end of time. Well, unfortunately, by using all of these methods in an all-out attack, Satan will succeed largely. Most people will be led to choose the easy way, leading to destruction. This calls for incredible discernment and wisdom on the part of God's faithful people. And where do we read about that? Well, look at Revelation 13, 18. This calls for wisdom. Whoever is intelligent can work out the meaning of the number of the beast because the number stands for a human name. Its number is 666. And look at Revelation 17, 19. Hold on, it must be 9. Did I? I'm sorry, 9. 17.9. 17.9. I'm back up here a second. This calls for wisdom and understanding. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings and, and so forth. Calls for wisdom and discernment. Wow. What does James say about that? Remember James 1.5? If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. We'll give it to you because God gives generously and graciously to all, my good news Bible says. Well, so in Revelation 12, we've been given a lot of history, very compact history, but we've also been given a very serious warning. As Satan's activities have been very successful in the past, they will be even more persuasive in the future. Are we awake and prepared for what is coming? We know that ultimately God has already won the great controversy, but the battles here on this earth are not over yet. And I think about that when, when uh, it talks about that. Do you remember the story about the Battle of 1814? I don't remember the American history of the battle. One of the biggest battles in the, in the, in the War of 1812 was the Battle of 1814 in St. Louis. The Americans won decisively. Two weeks after the war had already been declared over. The battle, they didn't need to fight at all. The war, the war was already over. Well, while some Christians talk too much about Satan's power, and we've, we've, we've talked about it some today, many so-called Christians doubt that Satan even exists. And I've run across some of those people myself, and it's amazing. People believe that stuff. Why is that? If one does not believe Satan exists, Satan hopes, then when he and his cronies perform miracles, she or he, that person who believes it, will have no choice but to attribute those miracles to God, which is exactly what Satan wants. Oh, Satan does a miracle? person thinks, oh, I can't explain this any other way. It must be super, superhuman power. It must be God. And who is it? It's Satan. So what should we have learned from our study of Revelation 12? How does it affect our relationship with God and to the devil when we realize uh, that the great controversy started next, right next to the throne of God, not on this earth? How does our understanding of the great controversy impact our understanding of the character of God? I want, to, I want to spend a moment or two. We don't have a lot of time left. What are the implications of the fact that the great controversy started not on this earth, but in the throne room of God in heaven? What does that tell us? The solution is not just here. It involves the entire universe. It involves God and everyone that has any relationship to God, and that means the entire universe. So the great controversy, we can't just narrow it down to, okay, how does it impact human beings here on this earth? We have to remember that constantly 
uh, not not only the the four living creatures and the twenty four elders and the hundred millions of angels or, or more that are standing around God's throne, but everybody who lives throughout the universe is impacted and watching everything that's happening. We need to remember that every day. The fact that, that sin began right in the presence of the heavenly family of the what we've heard to the Father, the Infinite One, should be a, a gives us a glimpse of the love and the f li unlimited b amount of freedom intelligent creatures have. Yeah. And he spent that all that time, and then he creates this earth to help answer the questions for the two-thirds of the angels, based on Revelation 12, the, the other two-thirds, who had heard all these lies and, and misrepresentation, they have the opportunity to begin to sort it out, and they finally didn't get it sorted out more concretely until the time of the cross. Yeah. Well, and here's something to think about. If Satan really believed that God was the kind of person that he claims he is, just, for example, arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, severe, a tyrant, and I could go on and on all the things that Satan has claimed about God, would he have even dared to rebel in the first place? If God were the kind of person that Satan claims he is, he would have zapped Satan right on the spot when he tried to rebel. I mean, isn't that true? What's really amazing is that as powerful as the angels are, of which Satan is one of them, mm -hmm. it is us tiny little human, degenerate humans who are going to vindicate God's ways. Mm -hmm. That famous last rem remnant mm -hmm. is going to demonstrate to the universe, yes, God, we agree with you. This is the only way to have peace forever, is to love one another. Exactly. Well, Revelation 12, we see, sets the stage for the portrayal of Satan's all-out final efforts to deceive, which comes in the next chapter, Revelation 13. It's interesting to note that as each char new character is, is portrayed in the book of Revelation, we look at the examples of the woman up there, and she represents the God's faithful people down through the generations. We looked at the, the dragon. Okay, in chapters 13 and 14, we're going to see a lot of other characters, and we're going to have to try to keep them all straight uh, and understanding each, each one. So um, I guess, Gordon, we have you coming up with some more words about that from the Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide in, and uh, also in our handout. The, there's lots of references in this section. You can look it up in, the, uh, in our handout. In chapter 1, Jesus appears as a character in the vision for the first time. This is a visual description and a bit of his previous history, followed by his actions in the subsequent visions. In chapter 11, the two witnesses are introduced similarly, followed by their actions in the context of the vision. So, what happens as we read through the book of Revelation, it's a, it's a relatively compact book, and we have a character introduced, and we get a few snippets about their history so we can identify who they are, and then John is assuming, God is assuming, okay, we know who those people are as we read on about them through the rest of the book. So, and again, what helps us in doing that? Our understanding of the Old Testament, right? Because almost all of these characters are symbols that came out of the Old Testament. So what does it mean that's to say that that woman that's at the beginning of Revelation 12 is dressed with the sun and the moon under her feet with a crown of 12 stars on her head? What can we possibly make of the huge red dragon with seven heads and set ten horns? It should be apparent by now, and it would be even more apparent if we could read the pa this passage in the original Greek, that it is all about war. What kind of war? There were no cannons or airplanes or huge ships involved in the war in heaven. The war in heaven was a war of words and ideas. What evidence do we have for that? First, the dragon sweeps a third of the stars down from heaven with his tail. The tail is an Old Testament symbol for a prophet who teaches lies. Second, the dragon is defined in Revelation 12, 9 as that ancient serpent, a clear reference to the lies about God spoken to Adam and Eve in the garden. Third, 
the dragon or Satan is cast out of heaven as the accuser of our brethren of our brothers it is this accusing words rather than the physical weapons that result in his being cast out and finally the dragon Satan is overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the words of their testimony so the word excuse me the war of Revelation 12 is not a military battle it is a war of words and ideas and I wonder this this word cast out how about let go mm -hmm. uh, because he doesn't have anything positive to contribute he, he's very uncomfortable in the presence of God yeah. he ha and, and, and under every circumstance whenever if er, Ellen White says in one place that if Satan were admitted to heaven at the end it would be utter torture for him he, he can't stand the the love and the kindness and the the you know that being expressed to everyone around but God it, it, we're saying he's not not comfortable being around the father or, or around God but is it because God is intimidating oh no or no, God no, no. is educating and he doesn't want let uh, Satan doesn't want yeah. to listen in his yeah. third thirds of his minions yeah well we one of the things that we need to sort of keep in mind here is that this this prophet this prophetic idea that a day in prophecy stands for a year it's interesting to notice that almost all scholars when they read the prophecies of Daniel 7 recognize immediately that the 70 week prophecy which turns out to be 490 days applies from the times of Daniel to the coming of the Messiah everybody admits that but then as soon as you say well okay let's use that principle to apply to other prophecies in Daniel and Revelation oh no we don't want to do that and why not if you really apply that principle pretty soon you find out the Seventh-day Adventists are the only ones who have the truth and I and I conclude but when one when should one apply prophetic days as years there are several guiding principles to consider one because apocalyptic prophecies such as are found in Daniel Revelation are full of symbols a symbol meanings a symbolic meaning for any numbers in the prophecy should be considered two year day num numbers tend to be the kind one would not use in normal speech no parent for example would say that his or her child is 1260 days old or 42 months old or even less say that the child is as old as 2300 evenings and mornings and three in a sequence of prophetic events that the prophecy makes more sense when counting the days as years one should do so and we've run out of time you're welcome to read the last few sentences in our handout but one of the marks of the remnant is that they are those who have the truth about Jesus the testimony of Jesus and that should be the predominant factor identifying the Seventh-day Adventist Church in these days our loving Father we thank you for these prophecies but most of all we thank you for the truth about your character and your government we thank you that you came and lived and died that horrendous life that incredible uh, witness that you lived here on this earth and yet how few people on this earth are paying any attention any longer to that marvelous witness Help us to do what little we can, not only to learn better about what you came and did and about your, your, the controversy and about your, the place you're preparing, preparing for us, but to do our best to make it known to others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.